That's all right. That's fair. When we create marketing content, which is a lot of what we do, um, I am currently the hard as nails. I have the final editorial say and value judgments that we can't back up, right? Things that are hard to measure. Um, I'm, I get very nervous about those. I try and cut them out as much as possible, right? Because what you have then is a room or an internet full of geeks who are like, oh yeah? How do you, prove to me that they're interesting. The cameraman wants me in the light. Okay, to here, to the, there. Okay, sorry. I'll do my best here. So hey, um, yes, so. Marketing. Uh, this is the stuff we love to hate, right? Um, and developers who, who live in a fact-based reality, right? Um, what do you think of, you know, bullshit bingo? <laughs> so there is such a thing as bad marketing and, you know, bad marketing will send the wrong message to the wrong audience and try to manipulate you or try and sell you stuff that doesn't exist yet or use words the wrong way, you know, um, or not, like, developing a relationship with you. So, so that is not what we are about at Open Strategy. Partners, um, we... Um, we work with technology organizations as their strategic part to partner to help them communicate their value, uh, connect with the people who need to hear their stories, and grow their communities. So uh, we do strategy marketing communication for technology organizations, and we have a special focus on open source. Who are we, Tracy? <laughs> I don't know. No, you don't know? No, nope. we need to find out. Oh, OK. So how many of you in the room are developers? And um, keep your hands up and, and or have a technical background, but, you know, used to be a developer, any uh, technical, okay. And how many people are managers? Yeah, cool. And, um, <laughs> and how many of you people, how many of you are marketers? Yeah, <gasps> Oh, cool. we've got a few. Right. Hey. Yes, represent. <laughs> um, so we formed Open Strategy Partners uh, most of a year ago. And um, Tracy uh, is a serious business person with an actual MBA um, and structure and formal education and experience in, in real business stuff. So um, from enterprises right through to startups and what have you. I came out of picking up uh, Drupal, the open source CMS, because I had a classical chamber music group that needed a website that I couldn't afford to pay for. Um, I was the 18th employee at Acquia um, and left when Acquia was about 800 people nine years later and I have fallen into a deep and very well appointed hole um, that is the uh, beautiful open source community. Um, so I have a lot of strong ideas about communications and how to connect people and so on and we put those two things together. Came up with this company and it's our incredibly, uh, it is our incredible privilege to have Heather James, Heather McNamee now on board since January. She's an incredible pedagogue and uh, a trainer and, and technical communicator. So that's us, that's Open Strategy Partners. We, we picked up somebody else two weeks ago, mm -hmm. which is exciting, so we're doing okay. It's, it's fun so far. Um, this is the first time we're giving this talk. Um, this is sort of the current state as of literally this morning um, about this topic and it reflects a lot of our thinking and um, what we're actually doing with some of our real life clients. So we wanna talk about uh, ourselves and what we call authentic communication, um, wh wh what it is and why we should care. Uh, Tracy's gonna present her contribution marketing canvas that you can use to build a, a marketing strategy, communication strategy to encourage growth to drive contribution and so on in your open source project, in your technical community, what have you. Um, and then we'll quickly go over the contribution flows, um, when all these things come together, what, uh, what can happen. Um, after having chatted with Lorna Jane last night, a couple of the things that we won't be talking about today so far um, are things like uh, 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 talking about in, uh, sustainable engagement, long-term contribution, avoiding burnout and so on. Um, we're focusing on the getting more people in and getting them started, presenting with them with something that makes it easier for them to, to be part of it and contribute. Yes? Yes. Take it away, Tracy Evans. Okay, so 
Jam, as you can see, practically lives on stage. Me, not so much. I was having a conversation earlier about this, so I'm far more nervous than he is. So thank you for your patience and understanding. Um, and so <laughs> what I'd like to tell you a little bit about is, you know, basically in, in developing any communication strategy, but especially one whose goals um, are focused around contribution, um, you'll want to identify your audience, define your message, and then communicate that message. Um, and what we see is a particular pattern, uh, which is easily to easy to recognize in open source, um, that communication drives connection, connection drives community, and that community actually creates a lot of business value. Um, and this is also a virtuous circle. So um, it's virtuous in that existing communities also create and strengthen connections as they grow and thereby generate more value. And this is all underpinned by uh, what we call authentic communication. And so basically, you know, if you want to break through the noise and connect with open source contributors and developers um, whose BS radars are particularly high, <laughs> I've witnessed and I've seen some online conversations <laughs> that support this, um, we need to swap out the, the buzzwords and the hyperbole for authentic communication. And what that looks like for us um, is doing this by starting from a place of empathy. And it was super cool to talk, watch the talk earlier um, entirely about this topic, and it completely aligns with a lot of what we were, um, our views and what we were talking about related to empathy. So that was, that was super cool. Um, but it's basically just uh, being able to put yourself in others' shoes and to understand their needs um, be trying, before trying to solve their problem. Um, and we want to be as clear as possible in the topics that we communicate using a common language and clear and relevant signals. And we want to build trust by avoiding as much marketing BS as we can and also making sure that our arguments make, make logical sense. Um, and so authentic communication needs to be both compelling and accurate. Is it me now? <laughs> Thank okay. God. Okay, yeah. Uh, um, <clears throat> Uh, one of the things that we're really looking into is, is cultural aspects of communication and internal communication uh, as we build our organizations is actually just as important as outwards facing external communication and contribution and, and community building and so on is definitely important inside of technology organizations. And um, uh, we've been thinking a lot about DevOps and breaking down silos and so on. And there's this... Um, um, there's this very common scenario where you have developer teams and business teams and they're just from different cultures. They don't understand each other. Um, they don't understand each other's needs. They haven't even thought of each other's needs. They lack empathy potentially. And that can lead to poor communication, which makes it all worse. So a culture, right, of mistrust, blame, and lack of respect can lead to slip deadlines and shoddy quality and demotivation and, and a lot of uh, turnover. And, and um, so... Um, you know, language is a, can be a problem here. You know, if, if, if a developers using jargon all the time, um, the business person might not understand that. The business teams might be taking actions uh, without talking to the technical people first. They might be selling stuff that you definitely have not built yet, right? But it's, you know, the... The, the VC, right, has put money in this and they want to see that it matches, uh, sorry, that it matches something, uh, it, uh, uh, that it's not a solution looking for a problem, right? And then the exec, she's under pressure, like, so she just went out and aggressively found some customers and to make the VC happy and now she's putting a lot of pressure on, on, on developer Dan, right? And developer Dan feels hard put upon and might just get out her resume and go somewhere else too, right? Um, and then... The execs have sold what turns out to be a crappy product, so the client that they got is not going to be an advocate later. They're going to leave disappointed, and the whole thing eventually is just going to fall apart, right? So you need to be inclusive. You need to use your empathy. You need to use different language, right, so that if you're transparent about building your culture, if you get the different stakeholders onto uh, teams to talk about what do you need? Where are we going? How can we do this? Uh, you know, for example, you might be able to come up with a solution where you find an initial customer who has the problem space that you're looking at who's willing to be a guinea pig at a discount, right? And every time you deliver something on top of the minimum viable product, every time you fix a bug, they are thrilled, right? Every time you give them something better and better and better, you're winning them as a, as a, as a champion for life. The, the, your, your, your source of money sees that there's a real problem being solved by what you're doing, 
right? The developers maybe are going to deliver uh, um, something. Is this still? Oh, yeah. So the developers are going to deliver something that, uh, you know, meets the minimum need that they've been part of discussing, right? And then they're going to be happy because they're, you know, your technical expertise has been respected, right? So it can be a virtuous circle if you ask questions, if you, um, you know, include everyone when you're planning things. So this is, a, this is one aspect of communication that I've now talked about far, far too long. But thank you is the most important phrase there, by the way. So um, when we talk about common language. Yeah, so we, need the, so we need empathy to build common goals for the organization through inclusion and transparency. Um, and we need clear communication with common, accurate language uh, to connect rather than divide. And you know, if you've started from a place of empathy, you'll understand that the needs of your business audience are not the same as the needs of your technical audience. And um, your choice of language should reflect that. And I've, I've um, experienced some of these situations myself where I was very confused about what a function did. And then we just used, you know, found different words that resonate to me as a business person um, that I understood what the value was for me. And, um, you know, some, some great examples are something like, WYSIWYG is a great technical audience word, but business-friendly authoring is a great business uh, term, or highly available file systems plus auto-scaling container orchestration for technical managers <laughs> is a fabulous term, um, but consistently scalable and highly available is better for a business audience. And, um, and sometimes a single piece of content like a data sheet might actually combine both the technical description and the business value that you get from that and can help clarify for both sides. I think you've got the next one too. Oh no. Nope. I put uh, that one on you. So it was gratifying to see uh, uh, Fra uh, Francis Fry recently do this TED talk. It's, it's very, very cool. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. Um, we at Open Strategy Partners have developed this uh, model of empathy, clarity, and trust in building our communications. Um, it's really uh, interesting that Francis Fry then de tr defines trust in her talk about, about rebuilding, building and rebuilding trust. She defines trust as logical rigor. OK, so you can't talk nonsense to me. You have to make sense or I can't trust you. Authenticity, if you're not being yourself, right? If you're selling something that you don't believe in, we're going to see through you. Um, and then the third pillar in her definition of trust is that I have empathy to you. So, which I feel ties nicely because that circles right back to where we start with empathy, try and understand your needs and what you want to, what you want to learn, how what we do can help. So empathy, clarity, trust, backed up by logical rigor, authenticity, back to empathy. Um, so, so, this is, uh, so in our communication, we're trying to send out trust signals and um, you know, not sell vaporware, try to be technically accurate, and um, especially in open source land, it's really, really, really important to celebrate the communities that we're part of, to highlight people's efforts who've, who've gone into building the tools that, that, the, that the we in business are selling, we are marketing or promoting, and that, that you are using, and also then improving as contributors and so on, right? So trust signals. Uh, two examples of, you know, that was some nice theory, two quick examples of how we at Open Strategy Partners put this into practice. Um, we use everything I just said to, for example, define a community and uh, stakeholders who need to know about your local development environment product and um, go and conduct stories, uh, find out, you know, who built it and why they built it and what they were doing and what the users are getting out of it, but like actually really talking to these people. And I can create expert level content not being an expert, if I talk with you as an expert and I quote you accurately, right? It's very, very powerful to actually ask questions, right? Then we create content, we publish it, we promote it, um, you know, attract more people to your thing and, and so on. So that's sort of a workflow that we use. And uh, one, of, uh, one of our favorite examples of this, Heather um, put in an awful lot of work into this. Uh, we all contributed it. Uh, one of our clients is Drud Tech. They make a really neat tool. If you work in PHP, check it out. Um, uh, we created the brilliant sprint guide. So we are talking about contribution at a meta level and their tool enables contributions. So uh, we have an open source, how to run a great contribution sprint guide that we created in the name of our client. Um, 
and it is also, you know, ready for pull requests, ready for you to use, ready to go and help you have better sprints. And this is um, marketing materials, right? So now this is us doing marketing in the open source space. And hopefully, um, well, I can tell you for sure that it's, it's not bullshit, right? It's incredibly practical and helpful if you want to go and, like, then multiply your own open source stuff. That's what we're about. So... Yeah, so, so now we'll look at ways that you can build a marketing strategy to increase contribution, which is kind of what we promised in uh, attending here. Um, and so basically, these are going to be structures that should help you to define your audience, clarify your message, and help people come and contribute to your project. And so this is the model. This is the contribution marketing uh, canvas. And I'm sure you're all familiar with the business model canvas by Strategizer. Yes, Maybe. no. Yes, yes, no. Business model canvas. OK. Well. It's, OK. The four of you, well done. The rest <laughs> of you, it's, it's pretty neat. It's pretty neat. Um, but we took our inspiration for, uh, from the business model canvas and um, reconstruct, reconstructed it uh, for contribution marketing. Uh, but we wanted to think about the components, obviously, very differently um, for this. And so we wanted to address, you know, what are your contribution goals? Who's your target audience? What kind of signals uh, put out a sign of vibrancy and quality? Um, why should they choose your project? project? So why, what problem is it solving for them? And why they should particularly contribute to your project when they could be contributing to thousands of others? And how they should contribute, contribute where to connect, and what stories to tell about it. So the first aspect of this is you need to figure out what is it you actually need? What, what, what is it in attracting community and users and contributors? Like, what is the thing that you actually need, right? Because everybody knows that this is what um, maintaining an open source uh, app, uh, you know, extension, plugin, like, it's like this every night of the week, right? Except Thursdays when it's movie night. No? Yes? Does this reflect your experience of maintaining open source projects, Lorna Jane? No. no. Is it more like that? Yes. yes. She said yes. <laughs> so, right? We need some help here, right? Um, why do I want contributors? Anybody got any? Why, why would you want a contributor to your project? Here's some ideas. Anyone else? Something else? Why would I want contributors? Community members? Yes. To drive business um, because maybe you sell support contracts to your project, or maybe they'll be your advocates, or maybe. Well, business means relevance. Business means relevance. Relevance means, more relevance means more contributions. That sounds awesome. I hope we wrote that down. <laughs> Shane. Okay, great. And then that opens the doors to more people using it faster, right? Rewrite the how-to guide for real humans, not Shane. Yeah, awesome. Okay, and here's some, so here's some, some, some reasons why we might want um, contributors. And um, so we need to come up with some project objectives. Where are we, where are we going? What is it that our, where are we today? And where does our project need to be? And what's missing to get there? So we might say, oh, well, we want to deliver tech and we want to grow adoption and grow community and contribution, okay? So those are our objectives here in this fictitious uh, use case we're telling, and we're gonna dive into number three, right? And we're gonna say, okay, growing community and contribution, concrete measurable goals, right? I want 20 more people at my next contribution sprint than at the last one. And I want a new sponsor, and I want people to talk about what I'm doing in public. So those are the goals I wanna fulfill. Um, these, of course, will vary wildly depending on what your project and your situation are. Um, so now we've gotten to a set of goals that we're, that we're painting onto this, to this marketing canvas. And so in thinking about who should contribute to your project, um, you know, think about based on your goals and the types of contribution that you need, who do you really want to attract um, to contribute to your project? Is it devs? Is it only devs? What about the writers? What about marketers? What about social scientists? What about philosophy majors? Um, and it just, 
um, it's really helpful to just take a step back and really think intentionally about who would actually provide a ton of value to um, contribute to the activities that you want to have done. Um, and it's also important to be clear about who is meant to be part of your community or event or initiative. And that doesn't need to be everybody. It's not if, you know, if you're targeted to everybody, you're not targeted to really anybody at all. Um, but it should be clear that um, here, you as a business person, you belong here, you belong in this room, you belong at this table, or developer, or marketer, or, or whatnot. Also, whatnot's welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so the next thing is a term uh, Heather actually came up with uh, one day uh, in, while we were talking, uh, vibrancy signals. You know, so, so yeah. If you go on GitHub and you see a project where the last commit was in 2017, or if you're on somebody's Slack channel and they don't answer for some number of hours or what have you, right? We're, we're also really, really sensitive to if, we, uh, if, this thing is, if this thing is still a thing, right? Is it still alive? Is it vibrant? Um, and there's a ton of ways that we have, a ton of signals depending on the project to decide is this thing really alive and are they doing a good job of taking care of it and of their and um can i just point out that i was so excited and this was a completely different perspective for me as a marketer um to look at that as important signals to communicate and that was something that um was really cool that heather brought on board when she started with us to point out that that is very much a part of the message that you're communicating yeah. about your project yeah it's great to it's great to be able to put a name to this for us right and then um Documentation, clear documentation is, is, uh, is certainly a part of this, right? Uh, you want to tell people as clearly as possible, you know, this is how we work, this is how we develop, these are our expectations. Um, so, and GitHub provides you a great opportunity to make a brand landing page in your README, um, show what your value proposition, declare your license, make everything as clear as possible. Um, um, community guidelines, this is how we do requests, this is how we develop, this is, you know, example code. The, the more of this you offer, right, the, the cleaner and tidier GitHub, Bitbucket, wherever you are, pages are, you know, the better off uh, potential new community members and contributors are going to be. Um, and then a fantastic vitality signal, of course, is testimonials, right? So uh, our friend Alex Burroughs in London is incredibly excited about the DDEV local development tool. And um, he really, actually, he really, he's a real champion. He really makes sure people know how much he likes it. Um, and the next question we want to tackle is why specifically your project? So. Um, is this useful and important to me? They need to become not just a user, but a, a, a high-level, uh, super in love with your technology and your project kind of user. Um, and you know, we need to have laser-sharp messaging that articulates what problem you're solving for me, how you're solving it, and why it's solving my problem more effective than any other alternative out there. Um, this is actually the strategizer guys, and this is kind of a subcomponent of their business model, just in case you're curious. Yeah. So this is, uh, in, in marketing land, that is uh, determining product market fit, right? Which is, which is not developer-friendly language. It's not the way that we would talk to with you about it. So are you making something cool and useful that will make another developer's day better, right? That's, the, that's, the, that's what this can help you. It's a, it's a neat tool. Um, so. If you find something out there that you think you might want to use or that you have used a little bit, there's, there could be, you know, you have to decide if you're going to contribute. And there are, there are good reasons to contribute to projects. Um, a lot of these, this particular list is I want to contribute because I want to make myself a better developer or I want to help others be better developers. Um, scratch my own itch, of course, is, you know, Oof, there's a bug here, and actually I know that I could write the patch to, you know, to do that, but um, do I want to? Am I motivated enough to? Is it worth it, right? Is the project vibrant enough? Are they paying attention enough that it's going to be worth my time, right, to help them out? Um, so some of the things that can get in the way, even if you have, like, very good reasons to want to do this, um, you know, it just could be really, really hard to set up whatever stack that thing runs on. Um, it could be that you're actually uh, new to contribution. You're really unfamiliar with uh, how pull requests work. Um, 
it might be that if you're doing this in a context at work, um, it might be that you're using open source stuff, and this is a, an entirely other talk that I give um, uh, between the, the bosses and the, and, uh, the, the, bosses and the developers, um, like, am I allowed to contribute back upstream? Because, you know, we're using all this stuff. So there's a companies who use open source technology all over the place but have no defined policies about contribution, and it's because I contend they don't understand the value that they derive from it, ask me afterwards. But um, so uh, my friend Chris Janssen did uh, an academic research paper on open source contribution, and we've turned this into a, a body of work together about the business value of contribution. So it's really, really typical to not know um, uh, how to contribute, or just not have the time to contribute, or have doubts about yourself, or maybe you just don't know if you're really, really allowed to. And those things can all be made worse by the embarrassment of asking, having to ask a colleague how to do something, right? Or the fact that it does take more of your time, or that you don't know what your priorities are at work, or that the scope of your, your, your activity at work is wrong and just doesn't allow you to actually go and fix the thing that's holding all the team back, right? So. These are real blockers in, in real organizations, um, and there are actions that you can take to unblock them. So uh, we felt, talking with our client at Drud, that in general, contribution sprints are a great thing, and there was a gap to, to produce a, a, a great guide on how to do them. So in that training and guidance enabler, the green things are enabler, right? Training and guidance, proficiency skill level, um, you know, we contributed to making those things better by showing how to do, you know, how to set up a good sprint. So better communication, teaching people how to do it, making time, adding contributing fixes to your definition of done. These are all great ways to enable contribution. And uh, one more analogy from Heather. She says, when you're trying to explain your project, uh, documentation is a map and uh, tutorials are a travel book, but training is a guided Sure. So we have 10 minutes, all right? OK, so let's get into how to contribute. Basically, there's <laughs> there are hundreds of ways uh, to contribute. And um, but if you target every type of contribution, you'll again be targeting nothing effectively. Um, so looking at the project goals, you need to ask yourself and your team, what are the key areas and activities of contribution that will help build uh, the project uh, momentum towards its goals that it's seeking. And, and note here that contribution is by, is by no means limited to coding activities, right? Somehow we feel it's important to say, Lorna Jane is nodding, it's important to say this over and over and over again. Um, Chris and I, in our work, between the research and the interviews that we did and our own experience, we determined what we thought were the seven-ish most, um, most effective ways of contribution. Um, code reviews are really often overlooked, and more people need more code reviews because that blocks, that really blocks coding contribution in general. Sponsorship always helps. Um, it would be super cool if p more people could make more open source stuff pretty, right? Designers, please help us. Um, and another thing, you know, evangelism is, is, is quite well understood um, in some contexts in software in certain ways, um, but marketing and marketing contributions seem to have been overlooked in many, many cases, and that's one of the things that we're doing uh, with our clients. Yeah, so um, <coughs> yeah, we d we've noticed that marketing seems to be an area that's often overlooked when, when they're thinking about how to increase contribution, and we've been working with our clients um, to help them, uh, help them increase uh, things like telling their story Getting, enabling the community to write blog articles or posting things on social media or helping with the branding and the CI. Um, and there's a lot more that we can do to better enable these activities. Yeah, and um, right, this, um, so, and there's one more concept that kind of uh, in, the, in the how to contribute and how to enable contribution. Um, there's these, uh, it, um, is it Dan Pink who talks about intrinsic motivation? Yes. Mastery, autonomy, purpose, right? So um, you can, the better your documentation is, right, the more you enable people to be autonomous. And 
the more you automate quality control, like having a test suite in place and so on, the more you, you can automate mastery, right? All the bad code that you've written, you can regex for bad patterns. All the things that don't ever pass your test suite, if I put them in because my coding, I swear you don't want it, right? It helps me if I a new team member, a new community member, whatever, the more automation, the more quality controls here, the more mastery you're actually transferring to the people who want to help you out, which in turn helps them learn, be more autonomous, and so on. Um, and if we've got a vibrant project that is helping that person you know, have a better day at work and they're able to give back, of course, this, this, this generates community, right, and a sense of purpose between us all. So, so actually, documentation and automation are incredible, uh, incredibly strong tools for generating intrinsic motivation. Second to last point here, we're doing okay on time. Oh, yeah, where to find people? Well, let's have a website, right? Um, um, GitHub and or GitLab and whatever happens now, um, social coding and so on, event participation, um, um, some of these things here, typo three. Um, uh, case studies are a really interesting case. If you can get people to talk in person about the benefits that they're getting from you, um, it, it can create some real connection and some real value. And sometimes a business person really, really needs to hear from another business person that, that this thing helped them, right? And, and if it's them talking, they're the people who have the money to pay us to do our thing. <laughs> right. So if we can get them involved, it can be it can be a really really huge help. Um, so we define what our project needs and what our specific goals right now are in terms of today in contribution and community growth, and we collect all these information these bits of information through here. Then we as content marketers, when we're thinking about uh, c content and mm, our kind of marketing activities, we put them together into narratives and stories. And. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, considering what your goals are, who you want to attract, why and how they should contribute, then you need to take that information and ask yourself what stories are important to tell? What are the narratives that are going to illustrate your great technology? What are the narratives that will illustrate a vibrant community? Um, and here's just a couple of examples that we uh, helped Drud build. And so this is, this is actually really, really from our work, and these things flow into editorial plans, uh, publishing activities, making videos, conference sessions, you know. These are themes that are actually important. Exactly. And then here's a few more that we've been working on with, with Typo3 to tell their story. Yeah. Um, and it's got a nice mix of the technical value um, and... Oh. Yeah. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Okay. I apologize. That's okay. Um, the Typo3 story for us is really interesting. We have the commercial arm of the open source CMS as a client, the Typo3 GmbH, and we have the Typo3 Association, which has allowed us to have a really interesting expanded mandate. So we're thinking about their technology as a whole and trying to grow adoption and, and, and all of that stuff around the tech, but also how we can sell, help sell their products that help, help your agencies, your job and so on, like extended support, um, training junior engineers, um, selling SLAs, um, working on the, you know, uh, the GDPR solutions for this. So there's a, this product side of things for us. Open source products are really fascinating um, to me. Um, but at the same time, we're doing community marketing um, and we're working, we're, we're helping with do PR and, and open source contribution. Um, and then we, we get into this, I'm gonna cut slightly ahead, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. Well, there's a, there's a really interesting point that I wanted to get to. Where's the writer's workshop slide? Um, no, d it, well, it fits in with the other. Oh, it fits in there okay too? It fits in where So it if is. you've put all this stuff together, um, uh, we get to this thing that we're calling the contribution flow state right now. You find, uh, you, if you, if I, if I get your attention, you see a tweet or something, right? Oh, hmm, typo three, ddev, other interesting client, you could be our clients, talk to me afterwards. Um, you know, and you read a blog post or you go to the website and you're like, okay, that's cool, and right? And then you download and it's open source so you can see the thing and you install it and it helps you a little bit and that's cool. And then, you know, um, you have a question and you go in the Slack channel and they answer it quickly. It's like, hey, this is all right. And you look and then people are contributing back to it and there's been regular releases and it's like, now it supports all different versions of Windows and it does, you know, other things. Like, wow, that's a community that's alive. Like, actually, this thing that I need, I'm going to contribute that too, right? So this, this map of we've set up everything that we were just talking about before 
so that it's ready for that to happen. Everyone can find their way in, in, you know, in a really natural, oh, I see what you did there, sorry. So, and here's another concrete example of this. <laughs> and so, actually, we do get into a little bit of engagement that Lorna Jane was uh, talking to you about yesterday. So basically, after, you know, once you have contribution, you need to support continuous involvement and incrementally higher value involvement. And, you know, asking people to begin with something small, although not unimportant, like sharing other people's stories or being interviewed for another person's story, um, it makes it easier to say yes when it's a small ask, and the incremental asks then build trust along the way. Um, and it also makes it easier to say yes to higher levels of engagement because we already feel invested and committed to the cause. So by the time I ask you to write and publish a story, you'll have already you know, been doing some of the things like sharing other people's stories or contributing other people's stories, and you'll feel invested in the project and want to see it succeed, so you'll be that much more motivated to spend the time in writing a story yourself. Or yeah. So a, a concrete example of this is actually the Type of 3 Com right, Community Writers Program that, that Heather um, and I have designed, and the community needs more content and more relevant content, um, and they need to be tighter in their communication, so we're going in, um, and we're doing reasonably regular online workshops. Here's how you run an interview with someone to use as a source for more material. Here's how you write a case study. Here's how you so on and so on, and they're kind of, they build on each other and they're cyclical, and we can have regular contact with our marketing team that way, and it's, it's, a, it's a pretty cool way of cat herding, right? And it's totally acceptable if it's six people or if it's, you know, 18 people, the online format is low investment for everyone, low cost, low travel cost, and so on. Um, so we're running these regular community writers program um, events now. We've done one live community uh, marketing sprint, but the marketing sprints now, the in-person sprints, will just be um, um, inflection points for a team that works together regularly and communicates regularly, working up that letter from like retweeting uh, the project lead to, to, to publishing an interview and so on. And these skills, right, um, are also all valuable for your agency, the, your project, the place you work, like whatever it is that you do besides Typo3, or whatever it is. Um, all of these skills just make us better contributors for everything we're doing. So this is another ex you know, concrete expression of the theories that we have putting into practice to actually help uh, clients. Yeah, and how we enable the rest of the community to contribute in a field that they may not have felt like they were experts to begin with. And part of that workshop, well, at least the bits that I've overheard, is um, encouraging people that they actually, they do and can have the skill set to contribute in that way. They don't need to have been a marketer or a professional writer. Everybody's got a story to tell. Right, and incredibly radically on time, um, <laughs> We told you a little bit about ourselves and what we call authentic communication. Uh, we talked about building up a structure to, to create uh, communication artifacts to, prepare, to be prepared to grow your community and, and, and contributors. Um, and some of the things that can result from being that prepared, um, we're not dealing with the sustainability and the long-term engagement part so much or like the specific tools of the trade or you know choosing this you know, tool over that tool. Um, <clears throat> but some models to start with. Yes. So um, we got a lot of stuff from the internet. Thank you, internet. <laughs> and thank you for coming listening to us. I think we have four minutes for questions. Yes. Any questions? I'll repeat the question for the, for the mic. You give it to him and you, you start, Shane. Uh, so for, for contributing.md, you need a good one to help developers understand how to do the code. What's a metaphor, what's a structure would you say? After contributing.md, also say, how do you contribute a blog post and look it back? Oh. Just like a real simple thing that matches your... Oh, so adding marketing uh, cues to your... Oh, okay, but, but what you're saying is adding marketing enablement into your, into your readmes, into your contributing MD, like, and all that stuff. Yeah, no, I think that's um, 
Write that down. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, 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 yeah. I'd be foolish not to agree with you. You had a... Uh, I was just wanted to ask if you have your slides available somewhere. Not for the cute animals, but uh, all those lists and graphs there are actually quite useful, I think. Well, right now, it's here. Um, and if you come and bother us in a sec, um, actually, you know, I'll, I'll spin you up a PDF and send it over, no problem. Cool. Um, well, technically, we will put this online. I just can't promise if it'll exactly be you know, tomorrow because we're a marketing company. We've been going, we've been incorporated since October. We have several retainer clients. Um, people are knocking on our door, which is amazing. But you know the cobbler's uh, children all don't have shoes, like our website is and we haven't blogged for ourselves yet. And you know, it's just one of those, um, how many of you web developers have incredibly beautiful personal websites? Yeah, so apart <laughs> from Lorna and him, right, you, you guys know what we're talking about. But yeah, so um, because you want the slides, that's a really great motivation for us to figure that out. Thank you. Otherwise, um, we're pretty easy to find. And uh, yeah, thanks again. Thank you.